I don't have much tolerance for people telling me about the greatness of German culture and the importance of reinvigorating it and so on and so forth because our ears start to jangle with rhymes and echoes. Uh, Douglas Murray destroys <laughs> Eric Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> there was blood everywhere. Not the way I cut, <laughs> cut it on my YouTube channel. So the issue is we have got to get um, more level-headed about immigration. We've got to stop fetishizing immigration. Yeah. Immigrants yeah. are not some special kind of person who's better than whatever you have in your country, which is how our politicians often sell it. Very often what immigrants do is you have, if you have a an economy that isn't growing at the proper rate through technology and, uh, and, and really uh, technologically led growth, you can create as if growth by letting in more people to support things like a, a pension plan. So very often what people are, are experiencing is, is that they're being lied to about immigration by immigration experts. Immigrants yeah. somehow are a free lunch, they only create good things, they never create bad things, they don't tax systems, mm -hmm. and then we treat everybody who wants to restrict immigration like me as if they had one reason for doing it. And what is that? Xenophobia, mm. right? Now, somehow, I married an immigrant. A giant chunk of my friends are, are immigrants, so I'm living in a, an immigrant experience even though my family isn't um, you know, recently immigrated. So I never had any fears because I'm fascinated by language and music. Everything in my life suggests that I'm fascinated by foreign cultures. If you are, then in general you want borders because anything else is gonna, it's like pouring all the paint together, you're not gonna get some beautiful rainbow in a can, you're gonna get you know, some sort of hom homogeneous um, thing that's not, not as interesting. So we've gotta get away from these crazy ideas, these, this mimetic complex. In the US, we've got a poem on the base of a French statue that was given to us, written by somebody who was not part of the French delegation, Emma Lazarus, saying, give us your poor, you're tired, as if this was American immigration policy, which it has never been. It has never been our immigration policy, right? And we have to exclude people at borders, right? Borders, fundamentally, you're going to dilute people, and then you're gonna treat people who are being diluted. Let, your vote will be diluted if you let in more people. Right. So there ha you have to be able to acknowledge that there are negatives with immigration. And, and as wait, you wait, say, wait, if wait, you're just, I'm, I'm, I'm on a head of steam here. Go on. Okay. <laughs> the thing that you have to realize is that the people who hold the cards on the immigration um, narrative have this idea that if you let any daylight in with saying there are problems with immigration, you get some sort of horrific outcome. Right. And those people need to be humiliated. Well, well, well look, look what the German government's been doing. Uh, uh, the, the beginning of January of this year, the government in Germany enacted a new law, which it's actually not entirely clear what it can do, but everyone already knows what it can do from social media, Facebook, and so on. It's, it's parts of the German government, including the intelligence services, working in conjunction with unnamed media companies to restrict the debate of the general public on these matters. Mm. Now, I just put it out there. Um, it, 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 lots of Germans fuming about um, something they think of as being uh, very unfair. What, what, what is the best way to make that blow up? Almost certainly to try to put a lid on it, dampen it down. Make, a, a German um, publisher said to me recently, the, the, the public now here read uh, our papers in the same way that people used to in Eastern Europe. They read between the lines. They read that yesterday a person did something to another person in a place. Mm. and they know they're not being given the information, so they fill it in themselves. Mm. Because they didn't name the person who did the act, it must have been a migrant, et cetera, yeah, yeah. et cetera, it's which actually on. means yeah. that the public mind thinks even worse than the yeah. facts that are happening. <clears throat> and, I mean, and, and, and people think there's no potential downside to this? Just, just one other point on this. <laughs> Eric, it's, th this is a subject of fascination for me because it's, it's such a terrible moral question to try to answer. I, I like Eric. I, I don't. I don't have much tolerance for people telling me about the greatness of German culture and the importance of reinvigorating it and so on and so forth. Because our ears start to jangle with rhymes and echoes. But at the same time, is it's not possible, as Eric points out, it's not possible for a, a culture to live in permanent guilt with no form of redemption ever, ever. And it's not fair. It's not fair, so, right? And this is uh, if you notice, having a conversation on immigration, I have, in a civilized way, waited 
to let you finish, which is yeah. part, of the, part of the importance of this I wouldn't conversation. Have bothered. I wouldn't yeah. have bothered. I was going to say that actually everything you said there, and that's what's... If, we, if, uh, if people in the audience do identify as centre-left, the last thing you want to see is the breakup of the European Union and its surrendering to far-right populism. And I can guarantee you, until we and unless we reconsider this conversation around immigration, it will destroy Europe, not just in a cultural sense, but in a, in a legal sense. So I'll give you an example of what's just happened in Denmark. Um, a liberal, in the European sense of the word, in the British sense of the word, a liberal head of state and prime minister in Denmark has just overseen the uh, approval in, in the Danish parliament of a law um, that it is an attempt too late to deal with this question of a lack of integration in, in their country, um, um, of what they call immigrants and children of immigrants, and it's a euphemism for Danish Muslims. And uh, what they've decided to do is approve a law in the Danish parliament that they will designate certain areas as, and they're using this word, ghetto areas. Um, and the children born in these areas, who are born to immigrant parents but are born in Denmark, are, are, are named ghetto children. That's actually the phrase they're using. And they've decided, uh, because they can't do this by religion or race or gender, they can do it by geographic area, and it's constitutional. And what they've said is that every, every um, ghetto child in these designated areas that the law stipulates um, will be obliged to go to citizenship class to learn how to be a Dane, and if they don't, the family will have their welfare withdrawn. But that doesn't apply to children who are outside of these areas that are the ghetto areas. The other thing they've said is that anyone who commits a crime in these ghetto areas will face double the punishment in criminal law than anyone who commits the same crime outside of these ghetto areas. They can see how a parallel legal system is in danger of developing here. And of course, what they've done is that you, in Sydney, I think you have Lakumba and a few other areas where there's um, Australian Lebanese Muslims. Is it called Lakumba? What is it called? Lakemba. Yeah. Lakemba, yeah. yeah, Lakemba. yeah. Lakemba. Right? So you can't say, okay, I'm going to do this where there's Muslims. What you could say is, okay, Lakemba is a troubled area. I'm going to do this in Lakemba. And everyone knows what you're really talking about is Muslims, right? Now, there is an example in liberal Denmark where this has happened. It's already, that's, that's the case now. It's approved in Parliament. And of course, the dangers of a parallel legal system are self evident. The dangers of grievances developing and people feeling like they are uh, being judged for the same crime in double the punishment and therefore being discriminated against, all of that doesn't really need me spelling out. Why did that happen is the question. Why has Liberal Denmark suddenly in their parliament approved this? And that's because of years of neglect of this one question, and that is integration. And it's why I'm saying that we, it's inseparable. We have to have a policy that ties immigration with integration and a sense of what the culture is of the countries that we're in. And that means slowing the whole thing down because you can't have integration if your immigration is too fast. Mm -hmm. And so when I say to everyone who identifies here as centre-left, if, if Western secular liberal democratic civilization is what you genuinely want to preserve, then the fastest way to its destruction is to have an uncontrolled immigration policy that leads to these sorts of things that we're currently seeing in Europe to a point where the far-right party can be the official opposition in Germany in 2018. But Majid, isn't the counterpoint to that to, to say, well, what, what culpability and responsibility does the far right have to take for this? It's all very, it's all very well to say we on the centre-left are responsible for Brexit because we didn't have a, an appropriate conversation about how to handle the Syrian refugee crisis, but the people who yeah. made Brexit happen were the people who were See, promoting Brexit and telling is, lies about yeah. Brexit. The problem I have with that argument is whenever we talk about extremism, we always do acknowledge that there are some grievances the Muslims have that led to them joining radical organisations. In my own case, I even cite that it was racism at home, it was the genocide in Bosnia, um, and in modern cases, in recent cases, the invasion of Iraq. Right. It's not that we're saying ideology doesn't also play a role in radicalizing Muslims, but we recognize that there are some grievances that would have made it a bit harder for Muslims to become radicalized if they weren't there. Um, invasion of Iraq being a classic case in point, there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq until George Bush went in. If we're going to apply that in the case of Muslims, then we must equally apply that framework in the case of right-wing radicalization. There are some grievances. I recently did a clip on my LBC radio show, and I, it was basically, what are the grievances of Tommy Robinson's followers. And they have some grievances that are legitimate that we need to address. One of them is the glaring double standard on... Lauren Southern, who's Canadian... People will know who she is. She's a Canadian um, populist right... Is it correct? Yeah, populist right wing. 
activist, I don't know. She, she was banned from entering the United Kingdom, right? Basically, she's a 20-something-year-old, attractive young lady who hasn't got a terrorist hair in her, or bone in her body. She has some uh, obj objectionable opinions that we have the right to disagree with, but she doesn't have a terrorist bone in her body, but she was stopped at the UK border under the Terrorism Act 2000, in particular under Schedule 7. Schedule 7 denies your right to silence under interrogation at any port of entry or exit, exit from the UK. <coughs> Basically, what that means is it's a criminal offence not to answer the police's questions. And then she was deported, right, under terrorism laws. That same month, a cleric was um, allowed into the country from Pakistan, who's on the record supporting death for blasphemy, and then he was speaking at a counter-terrorism conference. With a load of police. With a load of police, giving the police an award for their counter-terrorism work. And, and he was in Manchester, right? And so you've got this double standard here, where Muslims can get away with all sorts of extremist uh, 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 rubbish, to put it mildly, and are let into the country, and the terrorism law that should be stopping them isn't stopping them. And you've got Lauren Southern, who's a 20-something-year-old young blonde woman that doesn't have any terrorism associated with her, deported under the terrorism law. Now, that's a legitimate grievance. Whether or not you agree with Lauren Southern, that's a legitimate grievance. And so, if the invasion of Iraq radicalized a whole bunch of Muslims, that kind of behavior is going to radicalize a whole bunch of people towards the right wing. And we have to be consistent and acknowledge that there are grievances that can also radicalize people towards the right as well. Brett Weinstein, you're going to jump in. Yeah, I, I wanted to point out that there is an evolutionary force haunting this discussion. And I think it's worth just noting where it is and what kind of role it's playing. So, Douglas, when you point to this image of the boy washing up on the Turkish beach and this having a disproportionate impact on the conversation, there's an obvious evolutionary fact here, which is that none of us have ancestors that would ever have faced an image from thousands of miles away that would have been photorealistic and represented the tragic death of a child. In other words, to the extent that you saw a tragically dead child, it was a tragically dead child that was in your environment and therefore you would have some pseudo-statistical way of analyzing what its implications were. But you can't analyze a photograph in isolation at that distance because you have no idea whether it's a common phenomenon or a rare phenomenon. You're not wired to detect the difference. And terrorism itself actually is based on this very error. When you hear that people have been blown up in some public situation, in some locale, you can't calibrate how much danger you're actually in. So the point is, if you are a force that cannot uh, raise an army large enough to, uh, to push a nation around, you might be able to push the nation around by psychologically manipulating it into overreacting. So just the same way a bee is not a threat to you, but your allergic reaction to its sting might be, you can cause a country to have an allergic reaction by utilizing the fact that the images of terrorism are much more powerful than the, ter the terrorists themselves are. So the fact that we are ancient creatures trying to navigate a modern landscape in which we have totally unrepresentative data, and then people who understand that the data is going to uh, have effects on us employ game theory to cause us to have an emotional reaction to the question of immigration rather than a rational one. So I would argue we have to in some sense. If you as I do, believe that you must have borders, that you, they can't be open or you'll have a game theoretic failure of all of the successful policies within a country, but that immigration is desirable in some circumstances and should be allowed. If you're going to have that discussion and you're going to have a compassionate policy about immigration, it has to arrive out of a dispassionate discussion of the facts and how they interact. And all of this, in some sense, goes back to the question that Eric raises, which is why is it that nations, which I would argue evolutionarily are probably predisposed to xenophobia and to be resistant to immigration, are inviting it, and it has to do with this, um, this pyramid scheme. of uh, It's an economic pyramid scheme where you can solve a temporary economic problem by creating phony growth, which causes people to believe they are economically better positioned than they are. That is to say, the members of the nation feel that things are getting better because they have artificially gotten an influx of well-being that is really the result of the fact that someone has been invited into the economic ladder below them, but that can only go on so long. And so the whole thing is, a, is going to unravel ultimately, and the only solution to it is to have a dispassionate conversation about how to be compassionate about this issue. Um, but we can't get there until we recognize 
we're people who have inherited limits on what we can perceive and understand based on who we were 10,000 years ago, we're just not equipped for the modern media environment. So, so just to clarify, Brett, why, why can it not go on forever? Why doesn't the, the migrants simply become a new Australian or American and they replace you and then you die and then more migrants keep coming in and the, the country keeps growing? Well, there's a Half couple of this reasons. country has arrived since the Second World War. Sure, but there's a, there's a question about how large the population can get. So something, uh, I believe it is 50% of the protein in modern people is the result of the Haber-Bosch process, which takes mm. inorganic nitrogen and brings it into the biological cycle by, use, by burning fossil fuels in order to make it biologically available. So the point is, our population is way above what the ecosystems could possibly support, even if they were agriculturally uh, farmed intensively. What we're doing is we're bringing in nutrients that weren't in that system to begin with, inflating the population, and ultimately these systems aren't going to be able to handle it. Then there's also the question that Majid raises, which is there is a level of immigration at which the rate is low enough that assimilation is a natural consequence, that new immigrants find themselves better off by embracing the culture of the, of the country that they are entering. But there's a point at which you've invited in so many people so quickly that what you effectively do is you create these subpopulations that retain their own distinct culture, and that creates an in inevitable, I would argue, uh, conditions for racism. Yeah, I well, mean, uh, uh, and like, extremism. Yes. I, I mean, uh, example of this is, I mean, I, I'm not in favor of no immigration. I'm in favor of caution and of being careful. And one of the reasons of that, of that is because I see a lot of unexpected consequences. Let me give you one obvious example of the country that Majid just mentioned. Um, Denmark, like most of Europe, had post-war immigration policies that basically invited guest workers in, and then the guest workers stayed, which they hadn't expected, and then various other things happened. Now, nobody was talking about Islam in this period. I mean, it wasn't in Britain until the Satanic Verses affair in 1989 when the fatwa was imposed on a British novelist by the Ayatollah that we started talking about Islam in Britain, really. Yes, yeah, yeah. And in, in Denmark, it didn't happen until 2005 when one newspaper, one newspaper editor, the editor of the culture section of Jyllands Posten, discovered that in a set of children's books about the great religions, they couldn't find anyone to illustrate the one on the Islam because nobody was willing to draw pictures of Muhammad. And so this newspaper editor, the culture editor of the paper, commissioned 12 people who were prominent cartoonists in Denmark to do cartoons of Muhammad. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Some of them did ones that were saying the paper's provocative and unnecessarily provoking Muslims. Um, on the back of that, of course, there were riots all over uh, the Muslim world. Uh, um, uh, quite a lot of people were killed. There were burnings of the Danish embassy and, and so on. And, you know, and I, I, I've, I got caught up in a little bit of that, and I was in Denmark for the, the tenth anniversary of the cartoons in 2015, and um, I was telling Majid about this yesterday. It, it was a, there had been an event on the fifth anniversary, but everyone who'd been at the fifth anniversary had been shot since the fifth anniversary, so it was hard to find people to speak at the tenth anniversary. Mm. And uh, I and a couple of friends uh, discovered we had headline billing, and it was only after realizing the situation with the fifth anniversary, we realized why we were so prominent. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, this... Uh, it's funnier, this story. Yeah, oh, yeah, but, oh, yeah no, 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 the funny detail was, yeah, I discovered afterwards that both the U.S. State Department and the British Foreign Office had told British and American nationals not to go anywhere near the Danish parliament or the center of Copenhagen on this day because of the possibility of an attack on our conference. And I was like, well, they didn't tell me that. You know, so, <laughs> like, um, but, I think you got killed, Douglas. That's yeah, funny. probably. But anyhow, but, and, um, but the point is, is I, I, I mention this because I spoke to a, uh, a lot of MPs that day that was in the Danish parliament because it was the only building in Denmark that they could guarantee the safety of the audience in. Okay. Yeah. Just think about um, that for a minute, folks. Seriously. And, uh, and actually, um, uh, ISIS called for an attack on the conference, it turned out, that they couldn't get anyone there in time. And anyhow, I spoke to a lot of Danish MPs that day, and I remember one of them from the, the centre-right party said to me, I said, what's your view on immigration now? And, and she said, I don't want any more immigrants from the Muslim world. And I said, isn't that a bit, uh, you know, 
isn't that a bit simplistic and so on? And her response was, look, all the polling shows that 99.5% of Muslims think that you shouldn't be allowed to publish cartoons of Muhammad. So for every 100 people we invite in, there'll be 99 and more who won't allow our free press to keep on operating in a free manner. So I'm not taking that risk. Now, you can decry that and disagree with it, but it's, it's an argument that's worth thinking about. It also tells us something else, and that is something we've been neglecting for so long in Western debates about immigration, and that's culture is a thing, and it's really important. Mm. And it's important because what it means, what do we mean when we say culture, is all of the values that bind us together, mm. and it's our social contract. And if the social contract is being attacked, mm. we don't know how to live together anymore. Yeah. And so <clears throat> one thing that uh, Goodhart is very good at in, in mm. the UK is an author, David Goodhart, and we, we have been pretending for so long, especially through the 90s, with this word multiculturalism, that one culture is, is not in any way better than another. And, and so I think it was um, you and Sam, actually, both of you have been asked this question and posed this question before. And there is only one unequivocal answer to this question. Is what we enjoy here in Australia and the culture that we enjoy, <clears throat> whatever, however you want to define it, better than the culture that the Taliban want to create in Afghanistan? And there is only one unequivocal answer to that, and is yes, obviously. Mm. And you're being, again, people are gaslighting you, a, if, you if they equivocate in, in the answer to that question. Yeah, I, I do think that that's unnecessary. I agree with that statement. Yeah. So yeah. it's better here than the Taliban. Let's <laughs> well, be clear. I, I, I'll give away this. Sure. Sure. I'll I mean, say the, the flat whites are much that, better here than they are clearly. in Kabul. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the, all I'm going to say is that, that so we've got to at least recognize that culture is as important to this debate as uh, uh, how fast or slow the immigration rate, uh, rate it should be, because it becomes a political problem. The, the point is, you don't, that, that, that's overkill. Like, it, what you said is true, but there's some people who can't make any value judgments because that would be cruel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, it's not about that. Yeah. Um, you guys drive on a side of the road that I don't recognize as being the correct side of the road to an American, all right? Is it better to drive on the left side or the right side? No, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that everybody drives on a common side, that you don't have things that are incompatible, right, running into each other. And so if you have a, some state that says church and state have to be separate, and you have another place that says church and state are the same thing, mm -hmm. I don't need to get into a, def, a, a discussion about better or worse or values because that's unnecessarily value-laden. I know that you don't want those two things. Are the Crips better than the Bloods as a gang? I don't know. I just don't want to house them in the same cell block of the prison, right? Mm -hmm. So there are certain aspects of this that are simply about compatibility that can evade the value judgment so that we don't have to get into that thorny territory. Now, there is a... I think way too much of this ends up for an American taste because we don't have the same issues with Islam yet mm. uh, in our immigration situation that Europe has. So in the US situation, what I would say is you have never, ever, ever heard an honest immigration conversation. Mm. The people who sound compassionate are not compassionate. You have a class of people I call immigrant entrepreneurs who are making money based on immigration, like immigration lawyers or people who run pension plans who are trying to figure these things out from a financial perspective. And what happens is, is that you have domestic groups transferring money amongst themselves. Like, let me steal some money from over here and give it to some people over here in the same country. The owners of capital say, hey, I see that labor is getting a certain share. If I can use immigration, I can beat down wages by pushing out the supply curve and then fundamentally, I can capture a giant prize called the Borjas Rectangle, just living inside a tiny efficiency gain in economics called the Harburger Triangle. So you talk about the Harburger Triangle as this little efficiency gain, but the real thing that you're salivating over is if I can just get labor to hate themselves for worrying about immigration by worrying that there's somehow xenophobic, then fundamentally, I can push down wages and make it impossible for people to agitate for more money, better conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Which is why it's so bizarre that the left has been fooled. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. And I, I was told this by people in Washington. Somebody said to me, you don't understand how brilliant our immigration policy is. If you object to any part of it, you're a xenophobe. So we, we have a way of getting American labor to give up on itself because we will make them self-hating. Right? This is a conscious part of the conversation. And when I discovered in, 19, in uh, the 90s that in 1986, the American 
National Science Foundation had done a study of how to keep American scientists from making more money by using visas to make Americans mitigate their wage demands, I thought, this is completely bananas. We're supposed to be drawing our own people into our own fields, and we're secretly plotting against them mm -hmm. using economic theory. And what are we doing? We're using immigrants as an invidious tool to transfer money between groups. And then what we do is we say, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hurt an immigrant, would you? Well, no, I'm not angry at immigrants at all. I'm angry at domestic uh, rent seekers who have mm -hmm. figured out how to manipulate the situation. It doesn't require culture. It doesn't require any discussion of Islam. The key point here is, is that you have never been allowed to have or mm -hmm. hear a conversation about immigration in adult terms mm -hmm. where compassion, where self-interest, I guarantee you that there's nobody on this panel who is for open borders and there is nobody on this panel who is for closed borders, it, right? It, it, just in the European context though, I think the cultural conversation is, it, around Islam is, is particularly difficult to avoid because you've got citizens of Europe born and well, raised. I'm not saying that there is yeah. no cultural issue. Yeah. We have cultural mm -hmm. issues in the US as well. And I do think, to be honest, that we benefit from a certain amount of foreign culture to give us hybrid vigor. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm trying to keep American culture pristine and we have to only integrate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to only integrate. I'm pretty excited about immigrants and I want to make mm -hmm. sure that we have a, a sustainable stream for generations to come by not binging and purging and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. doing some sort of violent process that is based upon allowing people to manipulate our heartstrings against our, the, uh, our better interests. And, and, Douglas, and, and there's, a, there's a set of just good practice on this question as on a lot of other questions, which is not to presume that you can see into the heart of people who disagree with mm. you on an issue. Because that is the single, the reason why, as you say, you know, you're a xenophobe if you want to have any textured discussion on it. This is, does, does unbelievable damage uh, uh, to the debate. And obviously that's one of the ones it's most, most pertinent on, but I mean, every single one of the tripwire issues of our time is, is vulnerable to this claim. I can see into your heart, and I know what you're secretly doing. And none of your words may do this, and none of your actions may do this, but I know what you're really after. This is a very dangerous thing to introduce into debate. Because well, it, and this is it, what it, Kathy Newman is, the gift that keeps on giving. She, because, <laughs> you know, we all went through that, where, so what you're really saying is, right. is the one and, move. Uh, right. and, 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 the, and the real thing that comes to this, the, the, by the way, one, one way to solve that, which I've, occasionally suggested is that on this as on other issues there should be a punishment for frivolously making a claim that is untrue so if for instance you frivolously claim that the people who disagree with you are all racists you should suffer some form of societal yeah. shame and consequence equivalent to that which you are trying to hand out. Yeah. Otherwise, there's just no reason not to keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, I've said this to Sam before, we discussed this on your podcast, when I suggested that when people erroneously make various claims against Sam, he should just say, well, it's just a shame you're such a pedophile. And they go, what, 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 what? <laughs> and, you know, and if they say, I beg your pardon, he goes, it's not my <clears throat> fault you keep on shagging kids. And they go, what are you, what are you, you know? And they go, like, we're all quite annoyed about it, but you know, it's, it, it, it's, uh, and, and just keep, <laughs> just keep going on. Just don't say that because you know, you'll get $3.4 million but, out of it. But, <laughs> but you know, you should, you should say, look, you've made an insincere claim about me and I'm doing one back. This episode Let's of call the Waking Up Podcast is brought to you by Black Magic Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you were um, stuck in a fight yeah, on this, yeah. didn't you, on your podcast? Uh, uh, on operation. I want to hear from um, Brett and then yeah, I want to hear from well, Sam. Well, I, actually, I have a, um, I feel like we're, we're evading the hard case here. And I, it, it was what, the point where Douglas started, where um, he claimed that we are simply not up to the, the super stimulus of the, the especially salient ethical conundrum of finding the, you know, the, the, the corpse of a, of a specific infant on a beach or hearing too much of the pain of a specific family from you know, some war-torn area, let's say, let's say Syria. I mean, the, the, the refugee, I mean there's, there's immigration, there's economic immigration, there's, there's refugees, and that those are somewhat distinct, but if you make the, the, immig the, the economic disparities sufficiently wide, they, they kind of run together, and I think, I think the 
I mean, it's, it's hard to totally defend, on prag in pragmatic terms, it's hard to defend those who are calling for open borders. But, you can, but it, it, in ethical terms, I see their point, because we're living more and more in one world, uh, and we want to live more and more in one world. We should want to live more and more in one world. We, we have problems, long-term problems, that can only be solved by thinking as a single species on a single planet. Right? We, the nation states are not the end game for us as a, as a species. And uh, you know, whether we ever get to something like a world government, we have to recognize the, the, the ultimate untenability of, of living within our borders as though we could solve every human problem by just being selfish up to the political boundary between you know, where one line was drawn on a map. Uh, and we know, I, I think, all of us know when we take the time to think about it that we can't justify the ethical disparities in this world with respect to the variable of luck. I mean, some people are incredibly lucky to be born where they're born, when they're born, and some people are incredibly unlucky. And we're all very, very lucky not to have been born yesterday in Syria or 10 years ago in Syria. Uh, and when you focus on the specific case of a family in Syria trying to get out, there seems to be no ethical justification for not letting them in to this lucky circumstance. Now, when you pair that untenability with, the, with this other fact that the problem is not the problem we're talking about with respect to jihadism and a clash of civilizations and the, and, the, and the differences between cultures, the problem is not the color of people's skin or the language they speak or where they came from or the food they like or the music they, they produce. The problem are the ideas in their heads that they're willing to organize their lives around and uh, in many cases die for or even let their children die for, right? And some ideas are so bad that we have to do almost anything we can to keep them out of our society. But the idea is obviously cross borders. They cross borders on social media. They cross borders with uh, YouTube videos. And so it is on some level, I mean, the, 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 we, the real issue is that we have to win a war of ideas. Often in the heads of the very same people you're feeling sorry for, which is an important point. It adds well, a exactly, layer of complexity, exactly. doesn't it? But, so, but you take yeah. these specific cases. So for instance, like, if you said, I mean, this is something that happened to me in various contexts. I, I'm sure it happened at least once on my podcast, where I said, well, you know, if, if you find a, a family of refugees, uh, you know, if, if, we knew we were all, if we knew we could only let in 200,000 refugees, say, in any given year into the U.S., uh, to, to learn that this set of 100,000 refugees were all Christians coming from these war-torn areas in in the Middle East or in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, well, that would be relevant information. Insofar as we could actually know that they're Christians, that would be good news because what we're worried about now at this moment in history are in, in, the jihadists we might be inadvertently importing. Now, to say that as many you know, Christo, Christocentric bigots would, would also say is on the left tantamount to an expression of Islamophobia and, you know, bizarrely racism. Uh, but it is not an irrational preference. If, you're, if, if you want, 100% uh, of jihadists are Muslim, right? To not admit that is to be just tongue-tied by your own masochism and white guilt and to have been browbeaten by people arguing in bad faith. So the truth is we really do want to know what people believe. And the, you know, the, the, the question, how many more jihadists do you want in your society? The answer to that is always zero, right? It has to be zero. Uh, and so we, ha we have to argue about beliefs. We have, to, we, ha we have to find out insofar as that's possible what people believe. We can't just treat it like it's the left side of the road. The left side of the road is good for you. The right side of the road is good for me. We just have to agree to, to uh, disagree across borders, but within, within our borders, um, you know, we just, we, we have to uh, uh, stipulate that one, one thing works and the other doesn't. It's a bigger problem than that. We have to, we know that we are right to, insofar as it is possible, to go into Afghanistan and stop the Taliban from mistreating their girl, quote, their girls, because they're not their girls, right? They're, they're just girls who are unlucky to be born in Afghanistan. Yeah, but Sam, I, I have to say that 
um, th this is a rare point where I actually find that I'm in pretty serious disagreement with some of the things that you asserted without proof, which w were that um, compassion for others in less fortunate circumstances, some sort of Rawlsian veil, should be uh, treated with uh, visas and citizenship. And well, well, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's pragmatic to do it. I'm saying that's the tension here because I, I, what I also right. fear, I think, is that if we did, I mean, so what would be the consequences of opening our borders? Let's say compassion won. Let's say we said, yes, there's no way to defend this disparity and good luck that we find ourselves enjoying here in Sydney, say. So we just well, open, open the borders to the rest of the world. What happens? I fear there that you'll have uncontained immigration to the point where there's simply, life gets bad enough in places like Sydney that there's no longer any reason to immigrate, right? So that it's like there's some perverse osmosis that we would, we would witness where everything is brought down to the lowest common denominator. But we, don't, we don't want that. So obviously, we, we can be selfish enough to defend our way of life in the face selfish. of that. Selfish, I mean, like the, the language to me is so distorted. Um, you know, well, I, how, much, I would how much credit do you want to be given for being born where you were born in, in a context that was free of civil war? I, I'm luckier than some and less luckier than others, and that is a part of the human existence. I don't believe that I have an obligation to reshuffle the world according to luck. I mean, no part of natural selection. It's not, it's not an obligation, I'm just saying, but this, this is what makes the Douglas's starting point no, no, hard, just... hard to parse, because given enough information, right. Right, you meet the little girl. I mean, this is what ha happened to Angela Merkel. Like, mm -hmm. Someone brought the little girl right up to her. I mean, the little girl herself, I think, said, you know, what, you know why, why are you keeping my family out, right? And that just overwhelmed you know, her, her yeah, but any triage empathy circuit. <clears throat> yes. There are, I don't know how to say this, that the horror of the human condition and the beauty of the human condition are things that we have to accept. And what terrifies me is this over, this sort of simplistic compassion that we have for erasing these differences. I mean, I didn't build the differences in, I don't necessarily like the differences, but I know that, for example, if I brought everybody in Bangladesh and India up to U.S. levels of prosperity, I'd have an ecological disaster, right? And so does that mean we're obligated to mm -hmm. stop producing? Maybe. I I'm certainly open to these discussions, but what concerns yeah. me is, is that the level of analysis is not equal to the problem that presents itself, yeah. that somehow we've become simplistically compassionate. And I don't want to give up the compassion. Mm. I want to give up the simplicity. 